the Chilkat River. I survived from this river. I swamped the boat. Uh, I was baptized in cold water, capsizing a little skiff. The skiff was upside down. I didn't have a life vest. My boots were starting to fill with sand. So I said, uh, Lord Jesus, give me strength. Nathan Jackson is a really gifted carver who received a National Heritage Fellowship, the highest national honor in folk and traditional arts. He's a very traditional Tlingit. He is the leader of his clan, the Sokakhadi, or the Sakai clan. He's appropriately named Yehiadi, uh, which really means little raven or baby raven. That bird's a real curious bird, you know. Nathan's like that. Well, a lot of people know that he plays a great harmonica. When we got married, I didn't know he could sing. He was also a great raven dancer. He has become a mentor to so many of the artists who have grown up in those last 50 years and has really shared a lot of knowledge. He's not just a mentor for art, he's a mentor for life. I think he has an adventurous spirit. He's, he's up for a new adventure. He's up for something unexpected. He makes the best of any situation, whether it uh, be bad or good, and he's always got a real good uh, story and a joke to tell. As soon as I uh, got to shore, I kissed the ground. Yeah. Pretty smooth ride, huh? Yeah. <laughs> That's good. But I think about it, and I was brought out of the water. I was saved and got back with the Lord. My part of the country in Haines, Alaska, where the mountains are showing is just beautiful. And here you're a little bit more freer, a little bit more uh, independent. Uh, I uh, just enjoy just being alive. This is called the Raven House. It's something that is given to the whole clan. We want to be able to make this a little bit more functional. If, for instance, if somebody was going to teach weaving for a short period of time, that they could be able to come here, kind of uh, work it like a kibbutz almost, work together and share with each other and fellowship with one another. Austin Hammond used to start the Salvation Army meetings here. This became a place of refuge for anybody that was native. The responsibility that I have at this point is that I have to do my part. My Tlingit name is Yeshyedi, Yeshyedi, which means raven child or raven baby. My clan is called Tukach Adi. My father was Dukhsawedi. That is the kill whale. Traditionally, your father isn't the person that ends up raising you. Ordinarily, it's your uncle on your, your mother's side. I was born outside of T. 
Chinicky Springs and was born in a little cannery hut. One of the things that happened was my, my stepmom, her name was Sarah. She drowned and um, my stepdad, Archie Jackson, started having uh, issues. I lived with them until I was around 10 and uh, the government ended up taking me over and sending me to Wrangell Institute. Everything was strict. I think you have to learn to use your own initiative and there were some kids that didn't have that. I was just kind of glad to get out of Wrangell Institute. <laughs> it was kind of hard. I ended up going to my uncle's in Cake and ended up fishing with them for a little bit. And then, of course, my great uncle in Haynes, his name was Jack David. And for me, Haynes was much better than being in, in Wrangell. And I kind of felt like this was home. the Chilkoot River. Over here is part of a culture camp. This is a ideal place for getting the kids familiarized with uh, what uh, and how we used to live. My Uncle Austin tells me, he says, you have a loud voice. Probably the reason why is because you've inherited that voice from people who lived in amongst the Chilkoot River. Because when they talk, they talk to people on the other side of the river and they talk pretty loud. You know, I lived in Haines for a long while and I realized that where the wood is at is where I'm going to go. here in southeastern Alaska. Working with my hands, I enjoy doing that. I enjoy seeing wood being carved. Saxman's been a real nice, comfortable area to do larger poles. Nathan Jackson received a National Heritage Fellowship from the NEA in 1995. The National Heritage Fellowships are the highest national honor in folk and traditional arts that are given out by the country. This is essentially a Lifetime Achievement Award. There are some very readily recognizable figures who have received this, like B.B. King and Mavis Staples. Putting an artist like Nathan in that same category it's showing that these are cultural peers. Even if you don't know totem pole carving very well, even people who don't know his particular tradition now know that he is the Mavis Staples of, of totem pole carving. Nathan is somebody who has been a gifted traditionalist in some ways, and in other ways he's been an innovator, and he's been somebody who has uh, I think kept this tradition alive and relevant to people in an age where very contemporary people might say, well, why do we need totem poles? Nathan is one of the great founders of the contemporary Northwest Coast art. Nathan's artwork is very precise. It's very informed by the aesthetics and the techniques that have been in the Clinket community for hundreds of years. He's spent 
so much time working with old collections, going to museums, looking through the old things that they have, and really valuing the lessons that those objects can tell. They have new roles in the museum as teachers, and I think Nathan really understands that and has been an apprentice himself to the old material and then has shared that knowledge with so many of the younger artists. Nathan Jackson and his son Stephen Jackson were commissioned to make two posts. These posts tell the story of the grizzly bear hunter, Cotts. That's a story from the Tequity clan. And Cotts married a grizzly bear wife, betrayed her by returning to his human wife, and his children dismembered him, pulled him apart. So this is the totem by Nathan Jackson. You see the way that the eyes are put together, um, these beautiful ovoid shaped eyes and that flat plane all the way down to the raised edge of the nostrils and the lips. He has this incredibly uh, regular, precise ads work that you see finished here. You can see the marks of his ads as he's making the texture of the fur. His ads work is always uh, very precise. So Stephen Jackson's piece is this horrendous moment of betrayal. It makes people stop. It's shocking. It's full of blood and guts and intestines, fingers, but also the ovoids of the Northwest Coast, the U-forms. These two together here in the museum make people ask questions that would never be asked if they didn't exist as a pair. This is where I began carving, so this is where I learned really how to carve with my father. We were working on a project together. He was about 14. I says, well, Stephen can either work for McDonald's or work for your dad. He provided a monetary incentive. I don't know what it was, minimum wage at the time. I was attracted to this idea that one could be one's own boss in the same way that he started. He understands what he's doing, understanding the grain. It's quite simple. I mean, wood, wood is wood. That's grain. <laughs> Can't go it. I am doing the same job that I've been doing since 1974, <laughs> which is painting Nathan's stuff. When we have a short project and we're trying to get it done, and I'm painting in one section and they're carving in another, and the paint's wet, and the chips get on the wet paint, or they put their hand down on, you know, it's it's a lot less stressful if it's a really long one and I'm way 30 feet away from them. <laughs> oh yeah, if it's 30, 40 feet, it's easier. But it's when the when it's only like seven or eight feet, that's when it gets challenging. I think there's always possibility for tension within any working relationship or any family relationship, but I don't know, we've stuck to it, you know, 30 something years of working together. There's a real commitment from all three of us to try to like make the work, make the best that we can. <laughs> I love weaving. I was a textile design major in college, and when I heard at that time in 1972 that Chilcat weaving was a dying art form, I decided that I was going to learn it. With all the arrogance of a 22-year-old, I always say. Well, right now I'm working on this Chilcat blanket, and my first commission was from Nathan. He said, oh, why don't you make me a pair of leggings and I'll do um, some of my artwork for you. So we made a little list of what he would do in exchange for the leggings. I got everything except the mask, but you know, I got the artist, so <laughs> who cares about the mask?
time as well. No problem. He's patient. He shows appreciation. He's not arrogant. Mm. I got a real gem. <laughs> He's a gem. Jesus' name, amen. You have two artists who appreciate the same kind of work. I think anybody else wouldn't fit that too well. When we got married, I didn't know he could sing the way he can sing. One of the enjoyable features of our Christmas Eve candlelight services, fairly regular song by Nathan Jackson. Long ago that holy night, glory filled the earth and sky, shepherds worship at his When I think about childhood, I've had some real hard times. After a while, I figured, well, it's time to get on, move on. And so I joined the Army. Then afterward, one of the things that I did was go to church, went to the Salvation Army. And there was one fellow, and I told him, I says, you know, Sometimes I get tired of being alone and single. And he said to me in Matthew 6, 33, it says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. This was about the time that I almost lost my life there in the Chilkat River. Just that resonating scripture, everything just kind of falls into place. Dorka was just kind of meant to be. I don't think we would have gotten married, or I don't think we would have stayed married if it wasn't for the Lord in our lives. This is the homeland of the Clinket. This is the homeland of the Auk people. Nathan is a great artist, a master artist. And Nathan also sits on our Native Artist Committee, so he's helping provide the direction for the continued growth and evolution of our art. If you will remember, they were outsiders who came into our world and saw our art as depictions of paganism. They thought that we were worshiping creatures, so there was a real misunderstanding of our art. Thank goodness we had Nathan bringing our art out into the open, explaining what our art means, has had a beneficial impact on our people. It's helping them emotionally, feeling okay. It's okay to be Tlingit, Haida or Simsian. It's okay to be Native. So somebody found this in a thrift store in Anchorage, I think. It's painted on velvet, <laughs> oil painting on velvet, 1970s. <laughs> In fact, oh, excuse me, the 60s, 1964. I went to work at the World's Fair in 1964. The New York World's Fair presents the grandest spectacle on earth for 1964 and 1965. At the Alaska Pavilion, and uh, I was supposed to be a carver, and I ended up being a, a person who gave the spiel. And and that so was in New that, York. That was in New York. I had a microphone. They gave me a, a bullhorn. 
and they says you'll be saying stuff like talk to the Indians, talk to the Eskimos, and dance up there on this little shelf, and that would draw attention to people to come into the turnstile. Here's the real story. I was doing a poll in Fairbanks. It was 1988. I knew a fellow who uh, spoke Tlingit, so I was invited for supper. You know, I was sitting down at the table, and I looked up, and I says, oh man, that looks like one of those ugly little totem poles that we had to do in Wrangelin's too. And we got done eating, and I says, well, can I look at that? Sure. And there are those bears, those ugly looking bears. And not only that, he turned them around to look at the back Nathan and it says Nathan <laughs> Jackson. <laughs> he was studying at um, uh, Alaska Indian Arts. Remember that one? Saturday. <laughs> we were somewhat rambunctious in those days and and as a matter of fact, I remember one time Nathan and I got in a knockdown, drag out fight, but never, never affected us. I mean, we're always friends. 56 years, you know, he's been, he's been a buddy. I have a Clinket uh, chieftain with a, wearing a Chilkat blanket and an ermine hat, you know, with whiskers. Um, and he painted that for me for my wedding. It was a wedding gift. He is renowned in places you wouldn't even think of. Well, I've known Nathan since I was a kid. We started spending time together, I believe in 97, and he was working on the honoring those that give a poll, and that's uh, in front of the Heritage Center, the Totem Heritage Center here in Ketchikan, Alaska. That was the first poll that I had ever worked on He's definitely a conductor. I'm watching the way he moves around, you're, oh, you jump up and down and all these things, and you're underneath, you're inverted, you stand on him, you walk. And so I think, uh, at least for me, when I was apprenticing, I'm watching his body language too, and the way he moves, and I was listening to the breath. There's not a lot of people learning this, and uh, I'm blessed to be one of them. I thought I was coming here learning about art, and I learned, uh, still learning about life and to me he's a, a living example of, of uh, respect to self and respect of others above and beyond art. He's doing a lot for the community you know this is his job he does a lot of volunteer work he's playing the harmonica he's singing in church you see him on him and his wife Dorica on the side of the road during spring cleaning they're putting in their time well, I think art kind of is life. I have a praying mother, and she is thrilled that I'm able to connect with Nathan, and he's just one of the beacons along this life journey. Nathan was my inspiration. He was one of the heroes for me. I was a young child growing up in this part of the country. So you guys took this one out uh, moose hunting? Yep. Yeah. This sneaks up on all the moose because it's so quiet. Yeah. He was one of the rugged people back in the day. It's just amazing all the places that he's been. With Nathan, I think one of the important things to also point out is just what an important mentor he's been for new generations of people coming into this tradition. People getting together at Nathan's Carving Shed and, and spending time both 
observing and carving themselves with his guidance, but also kind of taking in the stories. His influence, I think, surpasses the kind of direct transmission of particular style into more exploratory and openness that people might not recognize immediately. He's a very international man, although he, he's still a homebody in Clinton. Sometimes fame is a hindrance, so it's hard to kind of balance everything out to be able to do what you want to do.